Hey, what's going on, everybody? Locked on Badgers. Thank you for making Locked on Badgers your first listen every day. Great show today. We got a true, true, um, legit NBA voice insider on the show. Talk about Johnny Davis and try to get a little deeper than some of the conversations we've been having. All that and more on today's Locked on Badgers. You are Locked on Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ryan Herrings, your host of Locked On Badgers. Thank you again for making this your first listen every day. You know, as we continue to build this community, I've always said we try to get smarter people on the show, generate better conversation. And today's host is that um, personified. We're going to bring Rafael Barlow on. And this is a guy with tons of irons on the fire. He's been featured NBA uh, TV, Slam, uh, NBA Draft Junkies. He's been a skills trainer. He's worked within the G League. Um, he has tons of irons on the fire. Rafael, man, thank you for jumping on the show. We're really happy to have you here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for inviting me on. And I really wanted to uh, jump in and make this a Johnny Davis conversation to, to start with. Uh, one of the things I wanted to start, uh, you've talked to some people inside the industry what have you heard or seen from people inside the industry about Johnny Davis's game that surprised you? What what's something that isn't out there enough about his game? Honestly, um, I mean, I think people just have a, a really good assessment on Johnny Davis. There really hasn't been anything, to my knowledge or from what I've heard, that has been surprising. I think you know what you're getting out of him, as far as a guy that just is like this relentless competitor, plays hard, rebounds. Uh, I mean, there are some concerns about his shooting, but other than that, I mean, I, I think the everything you've been hearing and reading has been pretty consistent. Is there when, when you talk about shooting? I've seen you say this before. Um, shooting, and you're, you've been a guy who's been a skills trainer. You've worked with a lot of athletes in the mm -hmm. basketball specter, and I've heard you say uh, shooting is one of the easier things for an athlete to improve upon. Um, yep. I want to ask you about when you look at some guys at the NBA level, guys like maybe a Bradley Beal who who maybe didn't shoot really well this year or a Devin Booker who's never, can you expound on that a little? And, and is um, Johnny Davis a guy that you would expect to shoot a little better as he progresses? Yeah. I mean, with those guys, sometimes their field goal percentage is down because of the shots that they have to take. There's those are the guys that are taking all of the end of the shot clock jumpers. I mm -hmm. mean, even with Davis this year, I feel like he's a tough shot taker and tough shot maker. Now, if he has a reduced role in the NBA where he's not taking the hard shots and he's not the main focus of the defense, then yeah, I expect his field goal percentage to go up. Now, I do agree. I mean, I guess it is my comment. So I, I do think shooting is the easiest thing to improve. and But also, I think shot selection is a skill also. So, I mean, I've seen guys that, you know, you get them in a, a workout, they can knock down – shot shot after shots but shot selection is a skill so if you're taking bad shots then it's going to lower your your field goal percentage but as far as like with johnny davis with his three-point shooting which is the concern i mean i think that's something that he can he can definitely work on and i think that you know the the strides that he made from freshman to sophomore tell me that he's a guy that puts in the work and he's certainly a guy mid-range free throw line you see the touch like everything looks yeah. right um yeah. And I want to touch on that. I think that's a really great point you brought up, especially as the season wore on. Davis had it; he had an ankle injury, um, but defense is also really just starting building a wall, right? They started blitzing him off screens, and then you saw him have to struggle to kind of adapt to that kind of defensive pressure. And a lot of times, you know, he either forced up a, a tough shot because he had to, or he was moving the ball, making the right play. Do, do scouts, I'm guessing you're going to see that, right? He's not obviously going to face that type of defensive pressure in the NBA. Is, is it crazy to say he's actually going to have easier looks in the NBA against better defenders, but he's not going to have that pressure on him? You know, I mean, it just depends on where he goes, to be honest with you. If he goes to, let's say he goes to Washington, which is a team that I've seen him mock to on some different drafts as an insurance policy for Bradley Bill. And if Bill is there, then no, he's not going to be the main focus of the defense. Now, if Bill leaves and he is the guy, then then that, that could be the case. Um, so I think it's going to depend on, on fit. And I think where he's slotted to go anywhere from, I guess really anywhere from like 6 to 12, I don't think he'll be like the top of the scouting report at the beginning of the season. Is this so? That's the next thing I want to ask you about. Six to twelve. 
is do you have any insight on where do you think he'll fall in this draft? Do you think he's going to be in the top 10 or just outside of it? Is there a team that you've heard is, is really interested in either moving up for him or sitting in their slot waiting for him? No, I haven't heard if there's I haven't heard specifically there's a team that is, you know, that is keen keen on him. I think anywhere from six to twelve. And you know, at this point it's an acquired taste. And then um you know, like, I mean, I think there's teams that may not be the actual best fit for him in that range. But I think after the top four, I think anywhere from five to 12 is a five to 14 in this draft is is going to be crazy. And I think anywhere mm-hmm. from 15 through about 35, maybe even 40 is going to be um, it's going to be crazy. So, I mean, I, draft night is going to be wild. And like, you know, with, with Davis, if he goes fifth. That wouldn't surprise me if he falls to 14 to like a, a Charlotte or a Cleveland. That wouldn't surprise me either. In five years, do you think it's more likely he's a high level starter or a high level role player or that he's underperformed his draft, his draft spot? I think he'll be a high level, a high level starter. Um, I mean, the key is, is the outside shooting. And if he is going to be, I mean, he, he could be a guy that could be like the face of a franchise or he could be a complimentary guy. So if he ends up being like a second option or a high level starter, then I think the outside shooting three point percentages are going to have to increase because um, whoever the main scoring option is, is going to need someone to be like a safety valve. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the intangible side of it. I've seen you talk about this before. Mm -hmm. Johnny Davis gives a crap. Like I just straight up, a dude gives a crap on both sides of the court. Is there just, does he do you almost just have to bump him up a little bit because you know you're gonna get consistent effort from him every day? Or is that a little over overvalued when teams are looking for upside? They're looking for the ceiling. No, I I I look at what a guy does. I mean, I, I am someone that kind of looks at upside, but one of the things that I do not like, and I'll say it, and I think unfortunately how it's gonna go is Shade and Sharp is likely going to go ahead of Johnny Davis in the draft. Mm-hmm. You have a guy that did not play at Kentucky, chose not to play. From what I've been hearing, chose not to really practice a lot because he wanted to protect his draft stock. And because he's a little younger and he has this perceived upside and there's this mystique to him, he's probably going to go ahead of Johnny Davis. That is that that is crazy to me. And mm-hmm. in my opinion, you know, if I'm Johnny Davis, I want him in a workout. Like, hey, right. let, I went out, I played... I competed hard every single night. And I mean, Johnny Davis rebounds like he's a four. And so for him, I could see, and I don't know him at all, but I could see a guy like Johnny having a chip on his shoulder. Like, why is this guy ahead of me? So I favor a guy that that is not trying to necessarily just protect his draft stock, a guy that's going to come out and compete every night. So, um, and it's just unfortunately how the draft works out and, but yeah, I would take Johnny Davis over Shady Sharp if it were me. If I right. were a team and I had to choose, because I don't think there's really that much of a age difference. If I'm not mistaken, it may be a year, year and a half, because Johnny was on the under 19 team last summer, and I think Shady Sharp is maybe a little older for his age. But I would take Johnny Davis personally. And just for to to reference what you were talking about, Johnny Davis led the conference in defensive rebounding last year, not as a guard. Like he led the conference in defensive rebounding per game. Yeah. And I think that's just a dude who's always going to be making those intangible plays um, and could really start off as a great role player on a good team, just fit into that culture and develop as the years went on. But I have a bit of a Davis bias, right? I'm a Wisconsin dude. So I yeah. see it every day. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about and just kind of finish up with this segment on this. I've always thought that his playmaking is a little underrated. Like he's yeah. able to drive, find players in the corners. I think I he's not a primary playmaker at the NBA level, but I could I think he can be a bit of a secondary playmaker. I don't know if is that something that that you jive with or am I a little off base there? No, I agree. I, I, I totally agree. And I think he'll look better as a playmaker with NBA spacing, with you know, more shooters around him. And uh I, I think so, man. I, I think that because he scored so well and had like these huge scoring outbursts. I mean, what was it like a 37 point game? Against yeah. Against Purdue. Purdue. I think people kind of put him in this box as just this relentless score, but 
I I do think that he does have some some playmaking ability, and I think he'll showcase it because at Wisconsin he had to score. Like in order for the team to compete at the highest level, he had to be that guy. I think in the NBA with a reduced role, you'll be able to see him showcase some things that he may not have been able to showcase at Wisconsin. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, coming up, guys, I have a comp I'm going to run by Rafael, who I don't think he's going to agree with me, but I'm going to see. Um, oh, I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> more of this Johnny Davis stock coming up. Uh, but first, today's show is brought to you by Rock Auto. Again, Rock Auto is the best place. I've talked about it a lot to buy car parts in 2022. Easy to use website, drop down menus, find exactly what you need at 30, 50 to 100% off uh, where, what you're going to get that local shop. And listen, guys, the local shop's fine. The people working there are great. They're trying to do their job. But quite frankly, they don't have the parts. Oftentimes, they don't have what you need. Right. So they give you the best they can give you at a price that costs more because they have to pay for the brick and mortar store. You don't need to worry about any of that at Rock Auto. Family owned business doing it for over 20 years. And they have built a community trying to save you money, trying to make it easier for you to buy the car parts that you need. Um, you're not going to want to miss out on this, guys. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car truck. Right. Locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Guys, thank you again for making Lockdown Badgers your first listen every single day. And now we're going to ask you for a quick favor. If you have a second, uh, we put together a survey trying to figure out what you like about the podcast. How can we make these shows for you better? If you take a second, uh, go to lockdownpodcast.com slash survey. That's lockedonpodcast.com slash survey. It won't take very long. And everyone that enters has a chance to win a $100 Ticketmaster gift card. Go to some great events and help us improve the show for y'all. Um, LockedOnPodcast.com survey. And we're going to bring Rafael uh, Barlow back on the show. Continue this Johnny Davis deep dive. And uh, Rafael, first of all, I want to, again, I mentioned at the beginning, you have tons of irons in the fire. Where can people find what you're doing? How can people follow you? Yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me on. Um, I really appreciate it. And I've followed Wisconsin a little bit because I know Chucky Hepburn. I've known mm -hmm. him since he was a little kid. His dad's a friend of mine. So, uh, oh, you know, when, okay. you reach, when you reached out, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, born and raised. So, oh, here so, we go. Yeah. So, I, I used to go to when I would go home for Christmas, I would go to like Chucky's games. And so, yeah, I, I know the family. So, but yeah, when you reached out, I was definitely um, interested in, in coming on. But you can find me at well, my podcast, Locked On. I guess it's Locked On NBA Big Board. And so it's on the Locked On family. And then uh, my Twitter is Barlow, B A R L O W E 500. And then I've taken over for Chad Ford, uh, NBA draft legend, Chad Ford yes. at uh, NBA Big And so it's a, it's a newsletter that I've taken over for, for him. I don't have all of his contacts, but I was able to, you know, get a lot of different contacts at the combine. So it, it's a combination of my own thoughts and my own opinions. And then I also gather some intel from NBA scouts and executives also. So it's kind of like a combination of what I was doing before at NBA draft junkies to what chat was doing at NBA big board. That's phenomenal. And we may have to segue just for a minute onto Chucky Hepburn. I didn't know that you had some inside knowledge there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember when he was, I mean, just a little kid. So yeah, I know him very well. Well, I know his I know his family very well, I should say that. We love his game in Madison. I mean, just a total pro. L looks like he's been playing point guard for 37 years, quite frankly. Um you guys got a steal. Yeah. No, listen, I wanna I wanna finish up on Davis. I, I have a comp for you, and I'm curious what you think. I, I feel like again, it's important to to know biases, right? I have a mm -hmm. bias for Johnny Davis. Uh, I have a soft spot for him. But there's a guy who came out in 2015. At the combine, 6'5", almost 6'6", 200 pounds, 6'8", reach. Basically identical body type to, to Johnny Davis, except for a little heavier. Devin Booker. I'm really curious. I'm not, not, I'm not saying he's going to – listen, Devin Booker just made all NBA, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's a high, high ceiling. But when I watch him play, they both play with the same type of controlled athleticism. It's kind of a, a pacing ability. They really understand pace of the game. They hunt mid-range shots. They hunt mismatches. They're both total dudes. You know, Booker shot it a little better in college. Davis plays a little more defense in college. But I think they both have that secondary playmaking ability, similar size, total competitors, mid-range game. I'm curious, am I way off base here? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that if Booker would have went to, like, let's say Booker goes to Wisconsin and Davis goes to, like, a Kentucky, right? Mm -hmm. I think their stats would have been similar. Because mm -hmm. Davis had to, I mean, he was the man. 
Booker had to sacrifice, which I still to this day don't understand why Calipari had, I think it was the Harrison twins playing yes. over Booker. Yeah, Booker was coming off the bench on that team. Yeah. And so, I mean, Kentucky guards, I mean, there is a, a history of them outplaying their draft position in a sense. I think that Booker, I think the difference is Booker had the reputation as a shooter. Because remember, he was kind of compared to Clay Thompson. I think it was kind of a lazy comparison in a sense, because physically they may have some resemblance there. But I think a lot of people thought of Booker as this shooter first, score second. And I think with Davis, he's more so considered score first, score second. Mm -hmm. And the concern is the shooting. So on one hand, I, I, I do get it, but I think the perception is a little bit different. And then, um, I mean, I like how you said they have like this controlled athleticism. But in my opinion, I think when you think of Davis, you think of he has more blue collar to his game because he I mean, he plays, he gives it all. And I say Booker doesn't, but Booker is kind of like really smooth. Right, right. While, while, you know, Davis, you know, like this dude is going balls to the wall every play. Is there is there a player either that you've comped into or that you've heard uh Johnny Davis comp to that matches up a little better in your head or someone else that sticks out that you're like, yeah, that game, that game lines up. No. And the reason is because there's no guard that rebounds like that. Right. You know I mean? Like, I right. mean, a big part of what makes Johnny Davis, Johnny Davis is you have to factor in, like you said, the intangibles. I mean, there's no guard that I can think of that rebounds, especially like, I mean, we, well, especially in college, you know, in the NBA, you may see guards rebound because the teams are just having their bigs box out and then run the floor. And it's just kind of like leaving it open for their guards, you know, from your, your Westbrooks to your your Lucas as primary ball handlers like LeBron. But those guys are all bigger, except maybe mm -hmm. Westbrook. But Davis rebounds like he's a four. You know, it is mm -hmm. not like it's for him to get the rebound so he can run and come and initiate the offense. He goes after rebounds. He cuts so hard with a purpose. You know, like to me, he's tough to he I mean, he's tough to find a, a, a simple comparison. I do think he does have like that 90s style game to him because of the mid range shots. He likes to post up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if he gets a smaller guard on him, it's kind of like bully ball. And I can't think of too many guys in the NBA that are like two guards that rebound like a four that like to shoot mid range shots, but love to like operate in the post and then just cut as hard as he does like off the ball with a purpose. I mean, he's like, you know, there's the term professional scorer, guys that just find mm -hmm. ways to score. Like you can't, I don't think there's anything that you can say, all right, let's let's take away his mid range game. Then I think he can kill you with off the ball cuts. He can kill you with post up. So he just has so much in his in his toolbox. So I, it's tough for me to compare him to anybody. I mean, he he seems like a guy that a coach like Pat Riley would have loved. That an old oh, yeah. school like nineties coach. He, yeah. yeah, yeah. He would just, have been on uh, the court, you know, like tackling people. Um, I want to ask you about this because you you mentioned the bully ball, the intangibles, the toughness, rebounds like a four. One of the big things I'm really curious about in the NBA, does that toughness, um, that just kind of intensity, those intangibles, allow him to play up and guard three, not all, listen, there's some threes that are lethal in the NBA, right? Can he come up in, in decent amounts of time and guard threes? Or is he strictly a two defensively? No, I think when the NBA, like how I judge guys as far as their position is what position they will play in a closing lineup. So teams may start with a big, but they downsize usually the close mm -hmm. lineup. So I think Davis could end up playing like the three in the closing line, especially like in playoffs. And I, I feel like this year more than others, I'm judging guys in a playoff lens. And so I think in the playoffs, Davis could end up, you know, defending threes. Absolutely. Especially when you see the lineups Golden State's throwing out there, you know, teams are going so small to Celtics. Like, you know, Davis could live in those those lineups and those rotations. Um, and he might he could almost do it right out of the right out of the gate in the NBA yeah. just because of the skill set he brings. I yeah. want to ask you about this. Um, because again, this goes back into a bit of a bias that Wisconsin fans may have. Johnny Davis has a reputation, I think it's earned as a tough shot maker. You mentioned yeah. that, right? A tough yeah. shot taker. Is that also a problem? Like, should should college players, the best guard on team, find easier shots? It seems like at times, and the defensive attention was slanted. But it still seemed like at times he had issues creating more space and creating easier shots for him. 
I mean, I think you can look at it two ways. One, I like the confidence, right? Mm-hmm. You can't say Davis was ever afraid of the moment. He's very confident in himself and his shot. And to me, that translates to I've worked on this shot. So I think it's a good shot. Now, on one hand, it could be bad, depending on how you look at it. But I'm going to lean towards it being good. I also think that he took a lot of tough shots because spacing in college basketball, especially in the Big Ten, it's a terrible. physical conference. So, I mean, how many guys from the Big Ten just get easy looks? I mean, even if you look at, like, Keegan Murray, a lot of people don't realize that the majority of his possessions this year came in transition. It wasn't mm-hmm. in the half court. And so um, I think that, you know, you have to factor that in. Uh, I think his athleticism is fine. I just think that with NBA spacing, he may look a little bit better. But I don't is have there, any questions with the with the tough shots. Is there um, – I, I want to talk a little bit about just um, – trying to think the best way to word this – Coming, coming in, coming from a guy that that really was the focal point of the entire team, which which he was at Wisconsin, to transitioning into a role where he might be a spot up shooter for for a year or two in the NBA, play defense, right? Is there any concern that teams are going to have? I think Davis probably not because the intangibles, but about taking a guy like that and moving him to a much smaller role. It, it could. I mean, I know one team I've seen him slide it to is the Pelicans. So if he goes to New Orleans, then he's definitely going to have to be at the very best, like their fourth option if mm-hmm. everybody's there behind McCollum, Ingram, and Zion Williamson. So then it kind of forces him more so into a role as you got to be a spot up shooter. You got to knock down these open shots. Now, I imagine with that being the the knock on him, that's something that he's probably focusing on or has been focusing on since the end of the season. So that fit right there may not be the best for him. Um, but I think with any rookie, you're going to have to make some huge adjustments. But even if he does go to a team like New Orleans, maybe they bring him off the bench and maybe his role is to be like the scorer off the bench. But one of the reasons why I'm not as concerned is because he knows how to play off the ball. Usually guys mm-hmm. that are like big time scorers, they have to dominate the ball. They have to get ISO touches. I think Davis knows how to cut. He knows how to create scoring opportunities, whether it's offense or rebounds. It's it's so many different ways that he can impact the game and score. So the concern is not that big there for me. I want to wrap up on this one with Johnny Davis. Um, we talked a little bit about looking forward, what you, what you think his ceiling is in five years. Is he going to be a star or a role player? I want to just more ask a basic question. The NBA drafts have always, and we talked about this a little bit, have always geared towards ceiling, typically. Upside, mm-hmm. ceiling, youth, athleticism. Um, players like Davis, it feels like you no, know, always, three or four years down the road, feel like they were underdrafted. Is there is there another player in this draft um, that you feel like is – going to slide down because he doesn't meet those traditional NBA markers that five years down the road, people are going to say, we really underdrafted that dude. Um, man. Yeah. I mean, possibly, <clears throat> excuse me, possibly Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. He, uh, he, he did well at the combine. I think he really made himself a lot of money. and helped his draft position at the combine six, six had a 39 inch vertical leap. I think seven, two wingspan played both games. But he's 22, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean, you know how the NBA is now. If you're 22, you know you're not considered to have this great upside. And I lean towards production over potential in a sense. Davis was productive, and like I, I'll go back to Shaden Sharp. He didn't. He wasn't productive at all. All right. you're going off is is this, his potential and what he did in the EYBL. Um, I'm trying to think somebody else that could be like that. Um, maybe even like a guy like Blake Wesley, mm-hmm. even though he's younger, you know, he just finished his freshman year. Um, I think his potential could push him towards being uh, a better player than his draft position. But this draft is such a crapshoot, man. I can't even, <laughs> it's hard to, like I said, I think 15 through 35, it could, I mean, it could be interchangeable. There's so much fluidity in this draft. It's got to make what you're doing enjoyable. Um, you know, it gives you a little yep. more fluidity. I, I do want to again say, man, thank you so much for coming on. Like, I don't want to take up all your time, but um, I really appreciate it. I always try to get smarter people than me on the show. I talk to the people who listen all the time. You are definitely that. 
that you're definitely one of the, the best voices out there for NBA draft content. So, Thanks. you know, I encourage everybody to follow you and, and see what's going on. Um, any last words on the NBA draft on Johnny Davis, anything that you, you think maybe we missed out on or that I didn't hit on? There was one concern that I, I did hear somebody say, and it, it kind of makes a little bit of sense. And so one scout compared him to Kyle Lowry. Hmm. And he compared him to Kyle Lowry by saying Lowry plays so hard during the regular season. And that is who he is. He always plays hard in the regular season. And the scout mentioned that he feels like Lowry struggles a little bit in the playoffs is because everyone else has matched his intensity. And so his concern with Davis is he plays hard all year round. Can he take it up another notch in the playoffs? Or is he always at that same intensity level? So he's, his, his theory was Lowry's great. I mean, obviously he won a championship. Mm -hmm. his, you know, he's had a great career, but he felt like the gap between him and other players is smaller in the playoffs because everybody else steps it up their intensity. He, he doesn't pace himself, but that's who he is. The reason why he is Kyle Lowry, you know, he's, you know, not, you know, he doesn't pass the eye test has always right. kind of had like this whole underdog role to him, but that's, he has to play that way to get to where he's been. There's but no on-off the switch. Yeah. Yep. And so his concern with Davis was all right in the playoffs and everybody's playing hard, every possession, does he have any more advantages? And I thought that was very interesting. So I want to flip the question back to you. How do you feel about that? Oh, that's a super interesting take because again, that's that's almost like uh, if you're good enough, it doesn't matter, right? Like Jimmy Butler mm -hmm. plays hard all the time. No, I think he does. coasts. I think Butler think does? has a no. I mean, he, now he does play hard. I don't want to say like he doesn't, but he always has like he he has another notch in the playoffs. Like you don't really sure. see him scoring 38, 40 in the regular season, but he does have another notch that he gets to in the playoffs. Well, I, think, I think it's it's interesting in the sense of. The, the the game is completely different in the playoffs, right? We've mm -hmm. see, we see that every year. Rotations change. They, sh they shorten up. You play different lineups. Um, so there is something to the fact that the game changes. And if you – people, quite frankly, don't play with 100% effort typically in a regular season game in January, right? So if Johnny Davis is doing that, that gap will shorten. But I yeah. think in some ways that consistency is still going to be one of his calling cards. And I think that's an important thing to build around. Because if you get Davis – you mentioned 6 to 12, somewhere in that range, right? Let's say you get him even at 6 – if he has uh, a similar career to Kyle Lowry, I mean, you take that to the bank every day from the sixth pick in the draft. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely. think that consistency is a calling card, and too many players, young players, quite frankly, don't have it. So it's a very interesting point, though. Um, yeah. It, and I can really see the logic think, behind it. Yeah, it definitely made me think about it, is that, you know, that's one of his greatest attributes is that he plays hard year-round, but – how does he have that that gap in the playoffs? And so it made me think. But actually, I like Charlotte for him. That's one team that I think could be a pretty interesting fit for for Giant. Now I don't know if he falls to fourteen, and I think Charlotte, or Charlotte thirteen or fourteen. I think they're thirteen. I think they're thirteen. Yeah. And Charlotte needs a big, like more than anything. But if it just so happens Jalen Duran and Mark Williams end up off the board, I think Davis and Charlotte would be a, a pretty good fit. Yeah, I, I would have a hard time seeing a dude like that fall to 13. Yeah. Right? Like, it just seems like somebody is going to say, this guy's going to be a 12-year pro, at least, at a minimum. And yeah. let's let's scoop him up. And, you know, worst case, he comes up to the bench for a couple years. Um, All right, guys. He is Rafael Barlow. Uh, appreciate it so much, dude. Um, And I hope to – maybe after the draft or actually offseason, we could talk Chucky Hepburn, too. Have you back on if you're interested. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Anytime. Just let me know. Shoot me a message, and I'll make it happen. All right, man. Hey, thank you so much again. No problem. Thank you for having me on. All right, guys. Rafael Barlow, again, tremendous host, bringing smart people on the show is all I'm trying to do to generate more discussion, more discourse. Um, coming up next on the show, guys, we're going to wrap up uh, Johnny Davis and also talk a little bit about breaking news that just happened with the Wisconsin football team uh, before we recorded the show. A new inside linebackers coach hired. We're going to touch on that quickly, and then we'll follow that up more on tomorrow's show with that. Um, but first today, guys, uh, today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs and information. It is your go-to site for um, baseball, basketball, hockey, racing, any type of, of sports news and gambling information. Easy to use website. There's a reason that we use it at Locked On. We love it at Locked On. 
The website is incredibly intuitive, simple to use. And it's it's a place where if you have some sports knowledge, you want to throw it out there, take $5 and have some fun with it. NFL Futures is a great way to have fun with the NFL. Uh, NBA Finals are obviously happening. If you think you have a read on baseball now, we're, we're almost at the, the, I think we're at the about 33%. We're about a third of the way through the season. If you think maybe a team like the Braves are going to come back, you know, it's a great time to have some fun. Do it responsibly, of course. But bet online, uh, head to the website today, bet online where all the action happens, game props, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're not going to want to miss it where the game starts, bet online. All right, guys, thank you again for making Lockdown Badgers your first listen every single day. Uh, I just want to hit on one piece of breaking news with the football team. The inside linebackers coach has apparently been filled. Uh, Mike Caputo, former safety for the Badgers. Uh, obviously, we had the Bill Sheridan issue came on as a new inside linebackers coach and then had some recruiting allegations from his Air Force time. He had to move on. So it sounds like Caputo's the guy. And I definitely want to dive into this more in an upcoming show. I'm not going to get into it too deeply today, but I want to touch on it. I quite frankly don't love the hire. He has no experience coaching inside linebackers. It feels like a hire because he's a Wisconsin guy. Um, Now, to some degree, you trust Jim Leonard in this process. He knows what he's looking for. He knows what he's doing. The defense has not made that many missteps in the last three or four years with their hires. So there is a level of trust there that we have to give to the program. Um, but it feels like they could have gone with a more experienced route. I mean, Wisconsin has been a top 10 defense in college football really over the last five, six years. You would think that there would be an inside linebackers coach out there at a lower level program that would be interested in taking that jump. But we're going to get into that more in an upcoming show, guys, probably tomorrow. Uh, thank you guys again for making Lockdown Badges your first listen every single day. Appreciate you so much as we build this community. If you like the show, um, leave, leave a like, subscribe, leave a review. All that helps tremendously. And I'm very appreciative of everyone that takes time, listens to the show, and interacts with us. Um, when you're done here, guys, uh, go check out the guy that was just on the show, Locked On NBA Big Board, Rafael Barlow, uh, giving you an in-depth look at all the biggest prospects, everything going on with the NBA draft. Obviously, we talked Johnny Davis, but there's a lot of Big Ten guys in this draft, too, that we've seen. Go give it a listen. Go give him a follow. Again, one of the, the smartest people with the NBA draft that's out there. Um, thank you guys again for making Lockdown Badgers your first listen and really appreciate it. Uh, we'll talk to you again tomorrow.